The Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals presents the timeless teaching of Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. Every individual in the world is described by one of these two phrases, after the flesh or after the spirit. It is a sad truth, but certain that those who are in the flesh, walking after the flesh, are the last to suspect their condition. The minds are enmity against God. Their wills are stultified so that they cannot receive the things of the Spirit, and their hearts are deceitful above all things and incurably wicked. Over a half a century ago, the late Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, then pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, saw the need to spread God's Word beyond the hearing of his local congregation. He started the radio outreach which has become known as Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible. The application of God's Word as taught by Dr. Barnhouse is as relevant today as when he first taught over the radio airwaves decades ago. The message we'll be featuring on today's edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is entitled Two Kinds of People. For years, the New Orleans Saints football team was so bad that the fans began to call them the Aints. Well, according to the Bible, there are only two kinds of people in the world, those who are saints and those who ain't. Are you one who walks after the flesh to fulfill its sinful desires, or do you walk after the Spirit of God and invest your life towards pleasing the Lord. The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Two Kinds of People. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee once more for thyself. And in thanking thee for thyself, we are thanking thee for all things. Every good and perfect gift cometh from thee. And we are eternally grateful that thou hast given thyself to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank thee for thy word. And as we study it once more, we pray thee that the Holy Spirit shall be our true teacher. If there are those listening who are of the earth earthy, show them their lost condition and bring them to life in the Savior. Teach all who are truly thine own what it is to allow thee to dominate the life and fill the heart. We ask these things in the name and for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The text that we are considering today is Romans 8, 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. According to the word of God, there are only two kinds of people in the world those who have been born once and those who have been born twice. From God's point of view, there is no other basis upon which a division can be made. God will never divide people into what the world calls educated or uneducated, cultured or savage, religious or irreligious, rich or poor, high or low, noble or ignoble. At times the Bible makes mention of these differences, acknowledging that they exist in the minds of men but just as surely denying that they exist in the mind of God. Take, for example, what we call education. I suppose that it's safe to say that in the minds of men of the middle of the 20th century, the greatest mind of the age was that of Einstein. Now, if we look at Einstein and then look at some low-grade morons, we can see a vast difference because we are looking at them from somewhere in between. We who look are neither morons nor Einsteins. But now let us look at the difference between the wisdom of a moron and the wisdom of God. What a vast difference is there. And now consider the difference between the wisdom of Einstein and the wisdom of God. 
the same vast difference is there. In fact, mathematically, there is no difference at all between the moron and Einstein, for in mathematics, while there is a great difference between one and a million or one and a billion, the differences between one and infinity, between a million and infinity, and between a billion and infinity are exactly the same difference. In any field of comparison, the result is the same. A Maharaja is rich when compared with his peasants, but both are poor when compared with the riches of the Creator, whose are the silver and the gold and the cattle on a thousand hills. Now our present text is here to show that the only difference that God recognizes is that between the men who do not have divine life and those who do. There are those who are after the flesh, and there are those who are after the spirit. We have previously laid the groundwork for this difference. We have seen in early portions of this epistle that all men were born lost, born in the state of enmity against God. The first chapters of the epistle illustrate the words of Christ, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. The subsequent chapters showed what God did about it and how he laid the foundations for saving some men by communicating divine life to them in the justifying process of redemption through Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. That new creation sets the infinite difference between those who are now separated in our text as men who are after the flesh and men who are after the spirit. There is no tiers etat of men. Men are in the first estate of those who are in the flesh, or they are in the second estate of those who are in the spirit. We repeat, there is no third estate. Every individual in the world is described by one of these two phrases, after the flesh or after the spirit. It is a sad truth, but certain that those who are in the flesh, walking after the flesh, are the last to suspect their condition. The minds are enmity against God. Their wills are stultified so that they cannot receive the things of the Spirit, and their hearts are deceitful above all things and incurably wicked. We do not say that there are no degrees within these classes, but we do say that the Scripture divides all men into one of these two classes. There are religious unconverted men and there are religious born-again men. There are unsaved men who are morally upright and there are saved men who are morally upright. There are unsaved men who live in criminality and there are saved men who, though they do not wallow in sin, live nevertheless in such a manner that they have to be called carnal Christians. Yet the difference between these two classes in God's sight is absolute. The highest classification within the ranks of the unsaved does not reach the lowest classification within the ranks of the saved. For the righteousness that men see in some unsaved men is a righteousness that proceeds from the corrupt heart of the Adamic nature, while the true faith that does exist even in the most carnal of all true believers is a faith that is born of the Holy Spirit and the life that is within the man is the life of God in Christ. Our text shows us four things about those who are unregenerate, who live according to the flesh. First, we have the description of their life. They live after the flesh. Second, we have a picture of their nature. They mind the things of the flesh. Third, we have announcement of their state. They are in death. Lastly, we have the mind of God about their condition, they cannot please God. Rainsford has a paragraph on the phrase after the flesh, which is well worth our consideration. After the flesh, he says, means in an unrenewed state. It simply means that you are as you were born of an earthly father and mother. What you were, you still are. No vital change has taken place. No renewing of the Holy Spirit has passed upon your soul. No life from the dead has taken place. You have not been born of God. You were not in Christ in early life, and you are not in him now. You had not the Spirit of God then, and you have not the Spirit now. You are just in an unchanged, unrenewed state. 
It is not necessary for a man to live a gross, vicious, sinful life to live after the flesh. There are the elegancies of the flesh as well as its grossness. There is the educated flesh as well as the uneducated, the moral as well as the immoral. Men may be living according to their conscience and yet be walking after the flesh, both practically and religiously. If conscience is not enlightened by the Holy Spirit, it is a blind guide. Conscience will only tell you what you think to be right, but you must bring your conscience to the standard of God's word to judge if what you think is right. There are many in our congregations over whom our hearts yearn. Alas, they are in a dangerous state, rocked asleep in Satan's cradle, conscience at rest, undisturbed, slumbering, unquickened, unspiritualized, insensible to the things of the Spirit of God or their own condition before God. There is a religion of the flesh that consists in externals, forms, ceremonies, voluntary humility, self-denial, and bodily exercises. But the religion of the flesh profiteth nothing. Where is the change of nature, the heavenly birth in all this? After the religion of the flesh has performed its external ritual, the man goes back to what suits his nature. He has done his religion, but it has not affected his character. It never touches his heart or his affections. Now it is written, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. This external religion is an insult instead of acceptable worship to God. He asks for our hearts, and we give him solemn vows, music, and fair speeches. A good concordance will reveal immediately a long list of things that are connected with the flesh, all of which are hateful to God. To take a few in alphabetical order, we find mentioned in the word of God the affections of the flesh, confidence in the flesh, the deeds of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, the filthiness of the flesh, glorifying in the flesh, the lusts of the flesh, the mind of the flesh, the purposes of the flesh, the seed of the flesh, walking after the flesh, warring after the flesh, the will of the flesh, the wisdom of the flesh, the works of the flesh. There are others which do not have a single word for their title, but which exist beyond question. We might add the faith of the flesh, the religion of the flesh, the prayers of the flesh, the worship according to the flesh, the God of the flesh. Now, when we put all of these things together, we have a picture of the normal, natural man, untouched by the Spirit of God. The unsaved man, our text says, minds the things of the flesh. What is it to mind the things of the flesh? Now, it should be noted here that there is no mention of a life of crime and iniquity but merely that the unsaved man minds the things of the flesh. Oh, so many people confuse sin and iniquity. These are as different as the whole and the part. All iniquity is sin, but not all sin is iniquity. It's like the proposition that all cats are animals, but not all animals are cats. A man may steal the inheritance of a widow. He is a thief and what he has done is an iniquity. But a child may go to the kitchen, disobey his mother, steal a cookie. Well, what he has done is sin, but not iniquity. An arsonist, through malice, may creep through the night and burn down the house of an enemy. Now that is iniquity, and we put him in prison for a long period of years. A child disobeys his parents, plays with matches, and burns down the house. Well, that's wrong, it's sin, but it's not iniquity though the result may be the same. Now, anything that does not come from God is imperfect and therefore wrong. The thoughts of man are vanity. The acts of the unsaved man proceed from the thoughts of his flesh, and they are all alien to the life of God and therefore cannot please God. The unsaved man lives for self, even though he is giving his life for the service of others. Another sentence from Rutherford is pertinent here. Nothing is said about crimes, 
but simply that they mind the things of the flesh, allowing their understandings, thoughts, affections, aims, tastes, wills, and desires to be occupied by the things of the flesh. Now let us honestly examine ourselves on this subject. The bent of our mind, what is it? It is not doubted that a man may say his prayers and read his Bible every day, but the bent of the mind, our aims, our chief desires, where are they placed? The apostle speaks elsewhere of those who mind earthly things, just the little things of every day, the latest news, the next dance, the trifles, vanities, mere emptinesses, not necessarily the gross things. If you could look into their hearts, you would find them filled with earthly things of one sort or another, and they never rise above them, except perhaps when the half hour for religion comes round, and then they are very religious. Now what is the state of such men? A state of death, present death, spiritual death, legal death, issuing, if grace does not interfere, in eternal death. And in the meantime, the practical result is dead thoughts, dead desires, intentions, services, dead works, and dead prayers. For the unrenewed soul we read in the Bible is twice dead, dead in law and dead in nature. And the religion of the flesh is fleshly and dies with the flesh. Observe that the apostle is not using the language of exhortation or admonition. He's stating a fact, namely that the nature, culture, purposes, promises, energy, fruits, performances, works, and religiousness of such are flesh. The character of those who are after the flesh is here determined by their conduct and their destiny is determined by their character. If we take a close look at our society, we can quickly discover that it is the sum total of the desires of the individuals who make up that society. Look at our newspapers. Why are the front pages of most newspapers devoted to the news of crime, the accounts of murder, and all the trivia of life? And why will the murder of a girl in her 20s especially if her corpse was discovered partially nude, or if there is some sex angle to the crime, why does such a murder get more news coverage than the murder of a 60-year-old woman who was killed for her money? If the newspapers fatten their pages on such carrion, it is because they know that the minds of the millions have the tastes of the vultures and the buzzards, and they serve them the meal in order to get their pay. And why do our radio programs and our television programs furnish a predominantly fleshly succession of hours? It is because those who manage these businesses know that they can never sell advertising if it is not keyed to the tastes of the masses who want the things of the flesh. The reason for all this is that the mass of the nation is unregenerate, and our society is the totality of its individual parts, and they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Now, I do not want to be misunderstood. I am not preaching a religion that centers on a list of things that one is to give up. Christianity does not consist of a set of rules, but of the new life that comes through faith in Christ. There are many things in the ordinary round of life that are done by both Christians and non-Christians. And when the Christian performs the act, it is in the spirit. And when the non-Christian does it, it is in the flesh. Let us look at the life of the average American man or woman. Upon rising in the morning, both the saved and the unsaved have their breakfasts, and most of the men go off to work, and the women get the children ready for school and then set about the affairs of the house. Both the saved and the unsaved glance at the paper, listen to a radio program, continue their tasks of the day. In the evening, there are some who go out to meetings of clubs or lodges, and some go to church meetings. Some stay at home and spend the evening reading, listening to the radio, looking at television. Some go out to visit friends or to see a movie. When Sunday comes round, in some parts of the country, almost everyone attends church, while in other parts of the country a smaller number attend. Others simply rest or amuse themselves as they have done in their free time during the week. Now it's certain that some of the people that do all of these things are saved people. 
and it is certain that some are unsaved. You cannot always tell the difference by watching the program of their lives. The Lord told the disciples that they were not to attempt to determine which were the wheat and which were the tares in the midst of the church. We can be rather certain that some people are not saved because they show no interest in the affairs of God from one year's end to the other. While the final judgment is with God alone, he has told us that faith without works is dead. And he has told us that they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But if we eliminate all of those who are openly alien to the things of God, who live in vileness and debauchery and who have no relationship to the true church, the invisible body of believers, and if we recognize that any of them who might ultimately be saved are special cases known only to the grace of God, we are nevertheless left with a vast number of people, millions and millions of people, whose lives look alike in general, but who are in reality divided into the two companies of the believers and the unbelievers. Two different persons may be active in a parent-teacher's association, yet the activity of the one may be according to the flesh, and the activity of the other may be according to the spirit. Two women may keep their homes spotless. The one may do it according to the flesh, the other according to the spirit. Two people may do church work, and the one may do it according to the flesh, and the other according to the spirit. God alone can see the heart. But you can ask yourself some questions that will let you know in which company you really belong. Do you love the trifles of the world? Do you want to hear news simply so that you can say that you're in the know? and that you aren't left out of things? Do you work in your garden merely so that you can show it as something better than the next door neighbor's garden? Are you active in what we might call church work merely to quieten your conscience? Perhaps you're not even sure of your own motives. I can probably bring you to a clear view of these motives by telling a story and asking a question. When I was a small boy, my mother had a tape measure that worked on a spring. It could be pulled out 60 inches and when released would snap back into its little case. I played with it and watched the way it would draw itself back into the case. Now your life is something like that. You have to exert yourself to perform certain tasks. But when you have finished the task, your mind goes back to some pattern of thinking. What does it go back to? What do you think about when you do not have to think about anything else? You add up a column of figures and when you have the total... You straighten up and rest your mind for a few moments. Where does your mind snap to at that moment? Down underneath, does your mind spring back to God and the things of God? Some people have a complete set of daydreams into which they enter and go over and over the same routine set of ideas. One man told me that a thousand times over, he dreamed that the owner of the business where he was employed died and left the business to him so that he could discharge the manager, his boss. One woman in her early thirties told me that she had a constant daydream pattern of being successful and of being loved. And from her personality, it seemed doubtful that she would have either. Now they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. One man told me that he listened to classical music and imagined always that Beethoven or Bach or whatever composer was being played, had not written the music, but that he had written it himself, and that it was being played for the first time before a distinguished audience who acknowledged his greatness. Now such people are walking after the flesh. They are deceiving themselves all the way along the road of life. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, and to be carnally minded is death. In our next study, we shall look at the religion of the man who walks after the flesh and try to give some help to those who have received Christ, but who find the old habit patterns still present with them. And in the following study, we shall hope to look at the other side of the text, the life of those who walk after the Spirit. And our God and Father, we pray thee that the Holy Spirit shall take this lesson to hearts that any who are thy children shall give themselves more earnestly to thee to walk after the Spirit, and that any who find themselves walking after the flesh shall come to Christ for deliverance and then for growth, that seeing thee and knowing thee, we may delight to do thy will and walk after the Spirit. Give restlessness to any who have not been born again, and upon all thy believing own, may thy grace, thy mercy, and thy peace abide, both now and till our Lord Jesus come again and forever. Amen.
A Christian heart filled with the Holy Spirit overflows with love, praise, and gratitude. Has the Spirit of God inflamed you with the desire to follow Jesus Christ in joyful obedience? We hope you have benefited from today's message by Dr. Barnhouse entitled, Two Kinds of People. You can listen to additional Bible teaching by the late Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse via the Internet by visiting us at AllianceNet.org. An audio copy of today's teaching is available by calling us toll-free 1-800-488-1888. Today's message again is entitled, Two Kinds of People, or simply request message number R8-8. We would also like to make available to you a free copy of our booklet entitled, Tragedy or Triumph. Our lives are often shaken by devastating tragedy, and yet we can look back later and see how God brought forth glorious triumph from tragic circumstances for our benefit and His glory. This free booklet contains six favorite sermons by Dr. Barnhouse, including Tragedy or Triumph, Who Died at Calvary, Oil and Wine, Salted with Fire, The Scales of God, and Falling into Grace. These messages will encourage, challenge, and uplift you. Ask for your free copy of Tragedy or Triumph when you call or write. Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible is a radio ministry of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals headquartered in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We exist to promote a biblical understanding and worldview. Drawing upon the insight and wisdom of Reformation theologians from decades and even centuries gone by, we seek to provide contemporary Christian teaching materials which will equip believers to understand and meet the challenges and opportunities of our time and place. Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible comes to you through the generous gifts of our listeners. If you've benefited from this broadcast and would like it to continue, please prayerfully consider a donation to help us keep this ministry on the air. For more information or to make a contribution to support and further our work, please contact us by writing Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, Box 2000, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103. Call toll-free 1-800-488-1888 or visit us online at AllianceNet.org. Be sure to ask for a free updated resource catalog featuring books, audio teachings, commentaries, booklets, daily devotionals, videos, and a wealth of other materials from outstanding Reformed teachers and theologians including Donald Gray Barnhouse, James Montgomery Boyce, Michael Horton, and Martin Lloyd-Jones. Then join us again next time for more classic teaching on Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible.